October 1, 2018, allegedly, according to that thing we call a calendar. And this is the Ocelli Effect, broadcast live from the facilities of Ocelli.com, but also heard on a variety of other networks. Do appreciate you for tuning in, no matter where you are, what you're doing. Uh, of course, you could be catching this further on down the stream via your final slab of choice, your applicable application, your podcatcher du jour, all that good stuff. And we appreciate you as well for catching the podcast. Anyway, so it is a Monday, a moon day, and, um, you know, I was not feeling well toward the end of last week, and, uh, it, it, it certainly showed. Um, uh, I, I've never had a hangover. You know, I've, I've, I used to drink in my younger days. Uh, I don't drink anymore, but I'll tell you something. When I did, I never got a hangover. However, when you don't feel well, sometimes it hangs over, so if I'm a little, Spacey tonight, I apologize. But it doesn't matter that much because I've got somebody who, even if he was spacey, we would definitely <laughs> want to hear from him uh, and hear every single word he says because, you know, a whole lot smarter than me <laughs> any given day anyway. And it doesn't matter what condition he's in. Jordan Maxwell, we're continuing the series on religion. Now, I know I kind of departed from it there at the very beginning, but just wanted to give you guys a heads up that we are back to rolling live and all that. Um, and, you know, you can dig much deeper into this subject and a lot of others by going to jordanmaxwellshow.com. Altogether, jordanmaxwellshow.com. Now, why do I stress that website? Because that is the only one that's Jordan's. <laughs> that's just the way it is. That is Jordan Maxwell's website. That's the only one. Uh can't say it too many other ways, but when you go there, um, there is also the Research Society. There's a button there. You can get into that and get way deeper into these subjects if you join the Research Society. Also, there's video streaming on demand there now for a couple of bucks. This way, it is cheaper than just uh, buying a DVD or a Blu-ray or whatever of Jordan's stuff from somewhere else, number one. Number two, you know that the money is actually going toward uh you know jordan's uh, projects here so <laughs> that's that's big helpful also uh you know there's a donate button and all that kind of good stuff and you start at jordanmaxwellshow.com there will be a link along with the podcast as per usual but anyway now that i've wasted all this time <laughs> Jordan, and uh, had to go through the preliminaries. I, I know you appreciate that we plugged the website and all that, but hate to keep you waiting. First of all, how are you doing tonight? Well, I think I'm okay. I think I'm like yeah, we'll find out as we go along how I'm doing. But uh, always happy to be on the show with you, and uh, it's been it's been a it's been kind of fun doing this as as a series. Uh, and we got a lot, lots more that we could talk about in relation to a series on religions of the world and where they came from and how they, imp you know, how they impact our lives today and where these things have come from. And I, I want, I want people to understand too. I'm not anti-religious. Uh, I'm not an uh, iconoclast. Uh, someone who tries to destroy religious faith and belief. I'm not, I, I have nothing to do with, uh, that kind of thinking whatsoever. I totally believe in a divine presence in the universe that men have called God. I don't have any problem with the idea of God. But I do know, because I've been looking at it for so many years, uh, 59 years, 60 years I've been looking at theology and religion. And um, I do know that the entire subject of, of world religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are absolutely uh, covered and smothered in deceptions and misunderstandings, misappropriating and, and misunderstanding the the words and the terms and the etymology of the terms, and so that today all three of the major religions uh, have no basis in fact or 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 value any intrinsic value for anyone on the earth. Judaism holds no intrinsic value for anyone. Period. 
Uh, neither does Christianity, the way it is understood today, has nothing to do with the original uh, understanding as far back as, you know, almost 2,000 years ago with the founding of the Christian concepts and ideas that were based on earlier religions. And, of course, uh, Islam offers us basically nothing. And so um, I'm just, I'm not against the spiritual beliefs I, t- I, I, I try and explain to people that I have a very high respect for the presence of God in the universe or whatever, uh, you know, if you want to define your terms. I say that God is a spiritual uh, presence. It's the only way I know how to explain it. It's just a spiritual presence of wisdom in, in all creation. And that, uh, you know, so I have no problem with the idea of, of a higher power in the universe that dominates our earth and our lives here. So I'm not anti-God. I'm not anti-religious. It's just that I realize the profoundness of how uh, far removed from reality uh, the the major religions, all three of the religions today, uh, how far removed they really are from anything that makes any intelligence intelligence at all. When you begin to look at theology, and we've talked about theology and where the word came from, and so I I, I know it, I've seen it so overwhelmingly and obvious for so many years. The, the real dark stories behind the world religions today, it has become so overwhelming to me that I really just, uh, don't mind dedicating what, what time I may have left as, as a 78 year old, but I don't mind dedicating my life, uh, to the exposing of all of the misunderstandings, the, misrepresentations and the downright lies and and the pegantry in, in all three major religions today. Mm. So that's what I try and do is just help people to get a better understanding of what it is they are uh, you know, supposedly believing and where these ideas have come from. And boy, when you finally see it, and it's a very difficult task that I have set for myself is to try and teach people and, and make make people aware of where these religious belief systems have come from and what they actually meant in the original beginnings as opposed to what we understand these religious you know, religions today, what they're teaching. Mm. Uh, and so it's, a, really quickly, it's a whole different story. You know, it's, it's just a big story. Sure. Really quickly, uh, I did already get a question on the Skype, and here's the thing, guys. If you're listening to this live, you can certainly go into the live chat room and enter a question, or if you're on my Skype list, that's fine. I'll even crack open the email if you wish to email directly to info at ocelli.com uh, to uh, make sure I keep track of this if you want, and uh, I will add them into the conversation as we go. And we have one question right off the bat, which might take us into a different direction briefly, uh, Jordan, than what you had in mind, but uh, I, I, I figure let's let's offer it up as they come in. And as I said, guys, if you enter it in the chat room or whatever, if it's coherent and relevant, I will uh, ask the question and be your voice. So, of course, yeah, there you go. I'm, I'm we're happy to do that. Sure. Uh, so the question here is uh, this is from Kevin, and yes, we are live. First of all, uh, which was his first question, but the second question. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. is, uh, is that you, you're focusing on and have focused on in the series the Abrahamic religions. Yeah. Doesn't that leave out uh, a great many Buddhists and Hindus and a huge population on the planet, which has also been deceived by their religious, uh, what, what does he say here? Understandings and concepts. Yeah, basically, yeah. I think what he's saying is that the organized versions 
of Hinduism and Buddhism, I guess, are all uh, misappropriated as well, and we haven't touched upon it, I guess, is, is really. So are, aren't we leaving all of them out, and what role do they play in this? Well, I'm sure that the, that the, I'm sure a lot of that is true, uh, for the ancient Eastern religions, but I'm mostly, uh, you know, obviously mostly interested in the religion that I grew up in, Christianity, and I've grown up, uh, hearing about the Old Testament and the, and the ancient Jewish people and ancient Israel and all the holiness of the holiness of the, of the history of the Jewish people and, and all of that. And so, uh, there's so much to, to talk about in, in relation to those three religions that, you know, you can dedicate your life to it and never cover it all. So, I'm not really interested in the uh, Eastern philosophies of Buddhism and Hindu, etc. Although, as I've said many times on this particular series, that Hinduism is the foundation for all three of the major religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, are basically based on uh, the Hindu religion. So that's the mother religion of the three big religions today that you know, most people either don't know and the ones who do know are not talking about it. They're not bringing it up. So that's why I have to. Right. And and truthfully, Jordan, I mean, just from my own personal experience really quickly to, to kind of uh, uh, balance out what you're saying too, is that uh, dealing with people that practice Hinduism, right, uh, at various points in my life, I found that there were individuals that sort of used it in very much the same way that you see uh, some of these ministers utilize the religion uh, with Christianity where, well, you know, if you come and you uh, give money and all this kind of thing, uh, you know, God will be favorable with you. Very weird sort of uh, a transaction, that uh, that I find really distasteful, you know. God only yeah. cares about you if you got money to put in the plate on Sunday, uh, yep. you know, kind of thing. And I always found that irritating. But on top of it, uh, I, I noticed that these, the, you know, the, these Hindu guys, which I don't even begin to understand the hierarchy of uh, Hindu priests and all that kind of stuff, but they exist. Uh, there are guys who are more, you know, revered in each of these sets of religions, and. Um, they do the same kind of thing where, you know, giving money to the favored guy in this particular part of Hindu practice is something that uh, is good for your business, is good for your family. The gods will be kind to you. You mm -hmm. know, uh, they also yeah. leave, you know, offerings to statues and things like that, which are rather interesting to me because, um, you know, all of the, the different decorations in the Christian yep. churches, like, you know, the statues of Mary and, yep. uh, you know, various other statues that a lot of people just sort of ignore and take as part of the background when they go into a lot of these uh, different churches. And depending on their age, uh, some of these uh, iconic images that are there in, you know, that, that are statues in one way or another or paintings or whatever, really interesting if you dig into the symbolism of it all and uh, uh, take a really good look at it. Because uh, there's stuff in there that's usually like, oh, I missed that. And, and very much like when you were talking about Moses with the horns and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I had missed that for years and years. I never noticed it. Um, but then I go looking back at these pictures and I'm like, wow, it's everywhere. And also finding, uh, you know, Jesus with a magic wand. Uh, pretty interesting. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it's all very, very very startling stuff when you actually see it for the first time yourself and realize it's been there since the book was published and it's been there for thousands of years. Uh, people, there are people who study these things and we've known it for thousands of years about Moses having horns like the devil and, mm. and, uh, and the magic wand, how Jesus and all the prophets of the Bible uh, work their magical, uh, you know, work that they did with magic wands, and that's all over Europe, all over Christianity, uh, are pictures and uh, you know, showing Moses and and Jesus and and the different prophets, and they're all doing 
wondrous things that we read about in the Bible, but they're doing it with a magic wand. And, uh, you know, and it becomes very obvious when you go looking into it, and especially with the technology we have today on the web, all you got to do is go on, on the web and type in or click on uh, image before you go surfing the web. Just type, <clears throat> you'll see a, a word at the top of the page says image, and you click on that which means now whenever you look at a subject on the web, it will just be pictures. It won't be, uh, the, uh, it won't be uh, text. It's just going to show you images mm. and, and pictures. And so <clears throat> when, you, when you start reading and, and especially listening to uh, the the teachers and professors in universities around the world talking about the history of the ancient peoples of the of the East uh, is it's really astounding when you finally see what has been done to the history of our world in order to sell the the world on the uh the the biblical theology that we now know where it came from and where and where these ideas developed and uh and like i said when you know that in the roman empire uh 2500 years ago uh there was a major religion in the ancient roman empire that was dominated uh ancient uh europe it dominated ancient Rome, and it was called Mithraism. And you, all, all you have to do is just go to a library and look up the word Mithra or Mithraism, and it will tell you that was the the main religion of the Roman Empire. And, and the god in the Mithra uh, religion was called Mithra, and he was referred to as God's son, the light of the world. And he was, um, you know, he he was, uh, uh, his father, his family were carpenters. His mother was a virgin, and uh, and he was born of a virgin. He died uh, on the cross, and he was resurrected and went into heaven, and he died for our sins, uh, so that we might live. And he had twelve followers, and those twelve followers. Uh, uh, and, and like I said, his mother was a virgin, and today the Catholic Church, all Rome, right. which the Catholic Church is, it's in Rome, and the Holy Father still uh, venerates the worship of uh, Mary, uh, Mary, the mother of God. And we now know, if you go back and start looking at the big reference works on, on these different ideas, you will see that no, uh, the mother of God was not Mary. M A R Y, but look at the encyclopedias on the subject. It will tell you no, it was Mari, M A R I, not M A R Y. Mari, and Mari uh, was a virgin, and she gave birth to God's son. Well, Mari, in the ancient world, meant pure and holy and pure. And so, uh, the, if it's a female that's holy and pure, uh, then it's a virgin. And so, uh, virgins today are still referred to as, as, as pure. They're, they haven't had any relationships with men, so they're pure. So, today, the word M-A-R-I simply means pure and, and, and original. So that if you get clean, clean water, we call it Mari water. And so Mari means a virgin. Well, the idea that the Messiah, or Jesus, and he's not the only Messiah. There's about 13 or 15 other uh, Messiahs in ancient history that had a mother who was a virgin. And then you trace it all back to the fact that there was... 12 helpers and 12 brothers of Joseph and 12 tribes of Israel and, and there were the 12 uh, stones on the breastplate of the high priest and there were 12 major prophets in the Bible, the Old Testament 
And, of course, Jesus had 12 apostles. And so you look in the back of the Bible and how many places in the in the Old, uh, Old and New Testament, yeah. look at how many places the word 12 shows up. It's just pages and pages of the word 12. And so why why is 12 so important to the biblical and uh, Jewish and biblical Christianity? It's because God's son, Jesus, was referred to as God's son, the light of the world. Well, of course, the son is the light of the world, the S-U-N. And so the 12 has to do with his God's son's 12 followers who help bring the light of truth to the world. His 12 followers were the 12 months of the year. And each month represented an astrological sign. So it was the 12 signs of the zodiac. And one of the signs of the zodiac, everybody seems to know, but nobody's ever seemed to think about it, yeah. One of the most important signs of the Zodiac was Virgo. Virgo was a virgin. Well, of course, God's son's uh, mother was a Virgo or virgin. And so uh, now you see that the whole story of Jesus being born of a virgin is actually the son uh, being born in the house of Virgo, the virgin. And his mother was a virgin. So it all has to do with astrology, with astrotheology, the study of the heavens. We're talking about the sun mm. and the stars and the 12 signs of the zodiac. And the entire superstructure of Christianity is nothing more than astrology. But it is a very high and interesting form of astrology because the whole story in the New Testament, if you go through the New Testament and look for it, you will see a continual symbolism uh, uh, and a symbolic metaphor story. So that the story of Jesus is not actual history. It's a symbolic story, a metaphor uh, to explain to you the way you live and the, and, the, and the place you live on the earth and its part in the solar system and how it connects to the sun and the moon and all the planets. And so, you know, we have seven candle lampstand, you know, because of the seven stars in the heaven we call the Pleiades. That's where it comes from. The seven major stars in the, in the constellation of the Pleiades were referred to as the seven sisters. And so uh, uh, the Jewish menorah has this seven candle lampstand. Why? It's, a beca it's because a, a candle represents light. It's not a brilliant light like the sun. No, but they're little, little lights. There are seven of them. And it's called a candelabra. And so... Um, that's exactly what the Pleiades, because the scripture talks about the Pleiades, and God said, you know, where were you when I, create, when I created the blessed Pleiades? Mm. There in the book of Job, God's saying, I created the constellation, the Pleiades. And everyone knows anything about the Pleiades, that there were seven major stars <clears throat> and they are referred to in, astro in astronomy as the seven sisters. Now, what's interesting is the number seven is also reoccurring seemingly uh, everywhere, right? I mean, this is another... Yeah, we have seven, seven days in the week. Yeah, but uh, it seems as though the number seven was put into uh, more action. Oh, you know, yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the concept of 12 and the dozen, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, this... Think about it. I mean, how many numbers have, you know, as many names and how many numbers have as many uses as 12, right? Even uh, today, no. we, 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 we sell eggs in 12s, you know, in, or fractions of 12s, right? Uh, right. one way or the other. Uh, everything is in a dozen, you know. It, it's, uh, you go to a bakery, you buy stuff. It, it's, it's in a dozen. Uh, right. but the number seven is interesting too because a lot of people see this, uh, 
symbolically, right? That the number seven yeah. is is God's number, in fact, you yeah. know, or the the lucky number, if you will. Uh, they don't see six in the same way, <laughs> you no. know. Um, but uh, but it's interesting when you take a look at numbers and how because look at the end of the day, a lot of this stuff when it comes to astral theology is about measurement and about relativity, right? Mm -hmm. So you right. know why why is it that the Virgin precedes you know why does Virgo precede the Sun? Well, because if, if you're watching these things move in the sky, and then you watch the succession of the different. Uh, uh, you know, uh, constellations. constellations, right? Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, you know, then you see that there is a, a story being told, but it, one wonders how it came to be that uh, all of these stories would be related to others as, you know, here, here's a man doing this. And on the one level, you could just take the lesson of it. Right. Uh, you know, how he treats others, how he decides not to, you know, the whole let, let, let's go with one of the most famous and overly quoted pieces in, in the New Testament. Uh, but the concept about casting the first stone. Right. A lot mm. of people use this all the time and they talk about it. They were about ready to stone somebody in short. And uh, and, and the Jesus figure goes over and basically says, you know, hey, listen, uh, if, if you whoever of you doesn't have any sin, go ahead and throw your stones. Uh, you know, it's an interesting lesson, but then there's astrological uh, realities behind what's being said too, <laughs> yeah. which is uh, is rather interesting. It's it's almost like, well, who who constructed this? Who engineered this? Uh, you know, to to be told in this way because initially. Right. I mean, what 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 does history tell us? People couldn't even read this to begin with. So it wasn't being read. It was being told to them. Yeah. Uh, it was being related to them vocally. Right. There would be a, a, a preacher. In fact, uh, the descriptions of stuff previous to Christianity said that there was effectively like one guy reading it and one guy acting it out. So mm -hmm. you had uh, like a preacher and an actor uh, demonstrating the story so that it was being read to you and acted out in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, because after all, like I said, most people couldn't read and all that. It seems like a lot of engineering to just have the priest class read it to begin with. Uh, what do you have to say about all that? Yeah, well, I, I that's what I'm saying is that the basis for Christianity in, to start with is uh, an encoded metaphor. It's a symbolic story that's really very interesting and very understandable once you know that what you're reading in the New Testament story of Jesus is a metaphor, it's a symbolic, encoded message that once you understand it's an encoded message, we hear, you know, we've heard a lot in the past 25, 30 years about Bible code. Well, I'm suggesting right. that there's a code in the Bible that is so big and so overwhelmingly in your face that you can't see it because you can't see the, the forest for the trees. Mm -hmm. It's right there in front of you. Jesus represents the truth and the light. And he said, I am the truth and the light, and no man comes to the Father lest he comes through me. And so the Christian ministers, they, they jump all over it and say, no, well, that means that you have to worship Jesus before God will do anything for you. You have to worship Jesus. No, that's not what it says. It has Jesus as a metaphor, a symbolic uh, metaphor that's saying to you, I am the sun. The sun represents light in this world mm. when the sun is gone the whole world is now in darkness but thank god he said i will return and so every morning about 5 30 god's son the light of the world re you know, it comes back right. it returns and so there's a whole metaphysical spiritual metaphor story uh, wrapped around the name Jesus. And so it has to do with, uh, and this is a, a subject that I really need to get into 
and start breaking it down. All, every time you read about something about Jesus, it's actually a metaphor. It's a symbolic story. And once you see it in one aspect, once you see that the story is talking about a, a symbolic story, then you start thinking, well, wait a minute, what about other things that Jesus said or did or what happened to him or whatever? And now you start looking at the same symbolism, that Jesus is not a man. He is not God incarnate. He is a symbol. For what? For the truth and the light. Mm. Well, when you say the truth and the light, what do you mean the truth and the light? Well, what is the light of the world? Well, uh, Jesus is called God's Son, S-O-N. No, it's S-U-N. And we've talked about that. It's called the Lazy O, if you know anything about the uh, uh, the history of the English language. The uh, you can use a, uh, an e and I mean a o and a u with an s, and so it could be s o n or s u n. Mm. And so when you see that Jesus is not represented as a man, that you're supposed to understand he's a man or or um, God in a man's form. No, he represents truth, and the truth is always associated with light. And, and lies and deception and ignorance is always as associated with the darkness, with the prince of darkness, the devil. Well, devil is simply the, putting the, the letter D in front of the word evil and becomes devil or devil. And you take an O out of the word good and it becomes God because God is good mm -hmm. and the devil is evil. So... I'm just saying that when you when you begin to see how the story is woven into a symbolic uh, metaphor about the war, uh, as the Apostle Paul said, there's a war going on in this world. And the war is between the light and darkness because there's 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness. And so the ancient peoples understood that in the dark is where evil things happen. That's when the predator animals come out, the robbers and mm. and and all of the criminal element uh, is operating in the dark. And today we even say that there were black projects and, and, and the people are being kept in the dark. And so it implies that the dark is evil, uh, bad things are done in the dark, but that the uh, good things are done in the light. And so there's a war going on between Jesus and the devil, or between God's son and, uh, and the prince of darkness. Mm. And so now you begin to see it's just a symbolic story of the war of the sun with the uh, prince of darkness at night. And the prince of darkness in ancient uh, uh, Egypt was called Set, S-E-T. And so today it does get dark at sunset. Right. And so in the morning when the sun comes back because he promised he would return, uh, you know, the devil uh, put him to death and he died, but he said he would return. Well, every morning he does return about 530. The sun pops up and he is when it pops up. He, he was known as uh, as the, the risen savior. Mm -hmm. And so he, this God's son becomes known as the risen Savior. Why? Because he does rise about 30, <laughs> 5.30 in the morning. The sun rises, and the sun, therefore, is your Savior. You don't think so? Wait till it don't come up. We'll be dead in about three weeks. So the sun is your, 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 your risen Savior. And he does have 12 helpers and 12 apostles or 12 signs of the zodiac that follow him, and one of them is Virgo the Virgin. 
And so it's it's a a whole symbolic story. Mm. And people have been misled by believing it to be history, and they completely miss the whole story of the New Testament because they are looking at it as history, and and the New Testament is not history. It's a symbolic metaphor story. Right. Now, a question regarding the metaphor uh, has come in, and I think it's really relevant to what you're talking about right now. That's why I'm interrupting you. Mm-hmm. Um, they ask basically that uh, the the meta. Okay, as for the as for the metaphor of Jesus, there are various ways to read it. Uh, let's see, I got to roll. Uh, sorry, I got to scroll piece by piece. Uh, there are various ways to read it. Um. There is the macroscopic and the microscopic. In other words, some people could read it and understand it to de- to describe how the universe functions. Others mm-hmm. could read it and say that it is a template for every single person. In other words, there yes. is a need for Jesus to be everybody. Uh, that That's exactly how it was worded, uh, just yep. so you know. But I, I, I think you catch what they're saying here. No, no, absolutely. And, and, but, well, let me give you some examples when I say the whole of the, of the New Testament is a metaphor. Here's the kind of thing I'm talking about. And once we get onto this idea of a metaphor in the New Testament, we could do about four or five shows, uh, on, on just that one subject. Because there's so many places where it becomes overwhelming and obvious. It was a symbolic story. You just never realized it, and someone told you. Mm. Put put a and pin so, in that because I would love to hear you lay out a few of those, like right in a row, and just explain. You know, yeah, look, here is yeah. the uh, here is the the metaphor. Here is the meaning of the metaphor, and here is how we know this. You know what I mean? Yeah, I would yeah. love to hear that. Now you could probably do three or four of them in, in a two hour show without a oh, problem. Yeah. So no, I, I would love to hear that for an entire episode. We're on episode 10 now. So, <laughs> but, okay. but, but again, you know, listen, this, this goes as many episodes as Jordan wants it to, uh, you know, as he lays these things out, nobody's rushing it. <clears throat> We're not doing this based on, uh, you know, a prescribed structure. It is basically about what Jordan wants to present and in the order he's decided to present it. Uh, so I just wanted to make everybody aware that that is still what's going on here, even though I am uh, occasionally interrupting to, to enter your questions or comments, or if I'm extremely compelled to do it myself, I will also. But uh, but generally speaking, I'm just going to let Jordan roll for the most part. And uh, we got about 20 more minutes in this hour, so by all means, go go right ahead and continue. But uh, and and still, I'm taking questions. If anybody wants to enter them in the chat room. Or on the Skype, uh, you know, feel free. I've also got the email open so I can see what you send to info at Ocelli.com if you like. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Well, for instance, uh, to show you how the stories in the New Testament about Jesus is a symbolic story uh, that's explaining to you in your human life on this earth is a war going on inside of you and on the earth, too, because you're part of the earth. So there's a war going on on this earth of which you are part of it. And so the same war is also, the Apostle Paul says, is going on in you. And so the war is the war between light and darkness, between intellectual and and spiritual enlightenment uh, based on intelligence and wisdom, enlightenment or the light of the world, as opposed to the devil, which is the the D in front of the word evil, which is the prince of darkness. And so the prince of darkness was set, as I said, and so it does get dark at sunset. And so uh, a classic example of a metaphor is uh, we're told that Jesus uh, was arrested by the authorities uh, they came to look for Jesus. Uh, the, uh, the the Roman authorities uh, came into the little city, the little town, uh, and they were looking for Jesus to arrest him. And we know that uh, that that little town 
was so small. It's not like the Chicago or, or, or New York. It was just a little tiny little town in, in the, uh, in the Middle East where Jesus was supposedly, uh, sitting in the garden, uh, by himself. And so it says that, uh, uh, one of the 12 apostles was named Judas from where we get the, you know, we get the idea that Judas was a, uh, a traitor to, uh, he turned his, uh, his, his, uh, master in and became a traitor and ended up committing suicide because he couldn't live with himself for what he did. And so the story is, is that when the soldiers came in looking to arrest Jesus, uh, at the, at the, uh, at the, you know, uh, at the behest of the Jewish, uh, rabbis, they wanted him to be arrested and put in jail and ultimately to kill him if he could. And so they couldn't do that, but the Romans could. And so the Romans came in to arrest Jesus. And, um, but the scripture says, um, that they, uh, they had a man named Jesus, one of the 12 apostles, and he came out uh, with the military, uh, with the, uh, with the, uh, authorities, and he went out and, uh, and kissed Jesus. And, and, and so that's a very famous story about Judas kissing Jesus. And so you'll say, well, why, why did Judas, a grown man, go out and kiss Jesus? And so the Christians will tell you, well, that was to identify him. Well, first of all, that makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, supposedly Jesus was known all over the Middle East. He was known everywhere. Any man that's raising the sick and, I mean, raising the dead and healing the sick and performing miracles, even right. Caesar in Rome knew where he was. And so why would the military coming to arrest him need Judas to go out and kiss him? Uh, well, now we know that it was a metaphor because, um, uh, and, and the 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 sun, uh, S-U-N, is really the hottest it will ever be is in the northern hemisphere on the first day of summer. So the first day of summer in our northern hemisphere, uh, it, it, the sun is directly overhead and it's not going any further north. So it's directly overhead, and it's full blast on us in the northern hemisphere, and it's really hot in the summer, and especially in the Middle East. And so the constellation that is associated with the uh, with uh, the summer was a lion, Leo, the constellation of Leo the lion. And so, therefore, the uh, Leo the lion becomes the lion of the tribe of Judah. Mm. The lion of the tribe of Judah is simply the constellation of Leo that's associated with uh, with summer. Well, as I said, the sun is really hot uh, on the first day of summer, but uh, thirty, uh, but ninety degrees around the calendar, around the circle, like your watch is a round circle with the 12 equal uh, members, the 12 signs of the zodiac, or the 12 numbers. Well, if you go one quarter around the circle, uh, that's 30 days for each month, and that's three months, and we call that summer. But then on the fourth, the beginning of the fourth month, now he's, he's no longer Leo the lion. He was really hot. But now he's not that hot. We call him, we say that he has fallen. And so we call the beginning of, uh, of uh, the next uh, uh, three months, we call it fall because the sun was really hot and now he's falling. And why, in what way is he falling? Well, he's falling southward. He was directly overhead. Now he's halfway down. Uh, going south, and so he's fallen. And so now from the time he starts to fall, which is in the fall or the autumn, uh, 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 another 90 degrees or 90 days 
uh, and he finally falls all the way down south, so he dies. To us here in the Northern Hemisphere, it is now winter, December, January, and February. It's freezing right. cold. It's, it's ice and snow everywhere. So God's sun is dead for us in the Northern Hemisphere. The sun is gone. He's dead. But, uh, but, uh, and so therefore he dies on the first day of, uh, of the autumnal equinox, which is, I mean, on the winter equinox, which is December 22nd. Mm. And so now he was the lion of the tribe of Judah, first day of summer. Then 90 days later, or, uh, or, or three months later, he's now fallen. And so what is this, uh, the, the, the uh, astrological symbol uh, associated with the fall, with the autumn? And that is uh, the constellation of the uh, Scorpio, scorpion. Mm. The scorpion is a constellation of the zodiac that's associated with the beginning of fall. And so the scorpion uh, is a backbiter. Well, that's what we call people who are traitors to you and who who you think are your friends, and one day they turn you in or turn against you or lie to you or cheat you, and then you find out they uh, you know, they weren't your friend. And so, uh, so they the Scorpio represents Judas. Right. Judas was a Scorpio because he was a backbiter. And so uh, when a scorpion in the Middle East uh, hits you, when, when you've been uh, bitten by a, uh, a scorpion in the Middle East, it has two cuts on your skin, uh, the upper and lower cut that's left on your skin when you've been bitten by a scorpion. And, and the two cuts... Are look exactly like uh, two lips. This is exactly what they look like. So when you've been uh, hit by a scorpion, it looks like someone has given you a kiss of death. That's why the mob has the has the story of you know they're going to kill you. They give you the kiss of death, and so they're going to kiss you off. <laughs> and so that's what uh, Judas now represents Scorpio, the constellation of Scorpio, who's going to kiss Jesus off. Now he's going to die. When, where is he going to die? He's going to die down in Capricorn. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, three months later, he's going to die down south. And when he dies down south on December 22nd, and and the sun rises on its on the lowest uh, the lowest uh, angle uh, is in the the first day of, of uh, December twenty second starts the winter official winter, mm. and so when the sun comes up down down in Rio down in South South America. It comes up on a particular degree. It rises down there on a particular degree. And that's on December 22nd, the official first day of winter. Mm. And the next two days, the second and the third, December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, for three days, the sun uh, does not go any further south, and it doesn't uh, start coming back northward either. So the ancient people said the sun was moving every day, one degree and one day at a time, until it finally hit the lowest point in the sky, which was December 22nd. But it rose, uh, and the U.S. Navy can show you how that's uh, the, you know, with their instruments, that the sun rises down there in Rio, down in South America. It rises on the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th on the same identical degree. It doesn't go any further south, and it doesn't come back north. So the ancient people said the sun, God's sun, uh, died for three days because he's not moving at all. So he's dead for three days. But then on December 25th, the sun actually moves and rises on one degree northward. 
And so the U.S. Navy can show you with their instruments that the sun actually moved one degree northward. Well, if it hasn't moved for three days and it was dead, it is now born again. It's now coming back to life. Right. Now, for the next three months, January, uh, December, January, and February, and now it begins to come back and it's going, it started on December 25th. It moved one degree northward. And so for the next three months, it's going to move one degree every day northward. And so the ancient Egyptians realized and the ancient peoples realized that the sun is now on his way coming back to us in the northern hemisphere. And so he's been dead for, for you know, three days, but he's born again. Now he's coming back to us. And so the very first week of uh, what we call spring, and so in spring the, the, the sun has crossed over the equator to officially start its journey back to the northern hemisphere again. And so the ancient Egyptians said the sun, when it crosses over the equator, begins the, the annual journey back to the northern hemisphere. And so he was dead in winter, but now he's going to spring back to life. Mm. And so they called it spring because he's springing back to life. And so, but the Egyptians said that when the sun crossed over the equator, uh, that was the official day when spring begins. And so, therefore, they called it the Passover because the sun has officially passed over the equator. Hmm. And now it's going to come back in, 30, in, in 90 days again. It's going to come back to summer. And he will then begin all over again. Uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then Judas, representing fall, will give him the kiss of death. Then he will go down further and die on December 22nd and rise on the horizon down there in the south, 20, 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. But on the 25th, it now begins to move one degree uh, northward. That means he's uh, born again and he's coming back to the northern hemisphere. Mm. As it passes over the equator, the ancient Egyptians called it the Passover. And so today we have the Jews celebrating the Passover, never realizing, no, as the sun has passed over the equator, bringing you spring. And spring, the constellation associated with spring was Virgo, the virgin. So the sun is now coming back to life in the northern hemisphere with its mother, the Virgo, the virgin. So he has a, his mother is a virgin. No, it's the constellation of Virgo that begins spring. Right. And now he's coming back to be lion. Of, so the whole story of Jesus being the lion of the tribe of Judah and how he dies and for three days he's resurrected and comes back to life. And his mother was a virgin, and uh, and so the whole thing was just a story of the trip the sun makes every year, starting with the summer and coming back around to summer again. So it's the trip around the watch. It's a trip around the twelve signs. Right. So it's just a symbol of the of the of in our world according to our understanding. That's just one of the ways to understand God's Son, the light of the world, right. as our risen Savior. And in case you missed it, it also explains to you why they placed December 25th to be Christmas, because, well, you know, they, they say that that's supposed to be the birthday of Christ. Well, it's not well, actually astrologically correct. If you take a look at the figure in the scripture, it wouldn't make sense that he would be born in December. But it does make sense that the sun begins to move and has resurrected from its non-moving state uh, yep. and has begun to make movements again. So, therefore, it is the birthday of the sun. Yeah, and so the Jews have the celebration. Mm. They have a celebration called the Passover. Right. 
And so, well, and so that means the sun has passed over the equator, and now the sun is coming back to us in the northern hemisphere, and we now are no longer going to be freezing to death and, and ice and snow and freezing. He has come back to life for us. Mm. And so the Egyptians said that the sun was pure energy. The Egyptians understood uh, the atom, they understood the uh, energy, and so one of the, one of the ancient Egyptian uh, concepts was that the sun itself was pure energy, right. and so pure energy represents life, and so that's why if you have a battery that's new, it's filled with energy, but when you uh, drain the battery to where there's nothing there, we just say it's a dead body, it's a dead cell. Dead battery. Uh, it's a dead battery. Why? Because there's no there's no juice in it. There's no there's no energy, and so the same thing is true today. Right. So well, that here's was, uh, here's something else that came in. This is from Daniel. Actually, it is uh, it reads exactly as follows: If as above, so below is taken to its logical conclusion. Wouldn't that mean that if the story of Christ plays out in the stars, it must play out in uh, physical time and space as well. Therefore, there was a historical person that played the solar hero. Uh, the addendum is, in short, wouldn't Yeshua had to have had a historical person? No, it does not mean it had to have a historical person. No, it's a story. That's why the Bible is referred to as the greatest story ever told. It's just a story. It's not the greatest collection of historical facts ever assembled. No, it's a story. It's the greatest story ever told. Why is it the greatest story ever told? It's because it's the only story that has ever been told. The trip of the sun through the life of mankind. It starts in the summer and is, begins to die in the fall and then he's falling down, and now he's going to die. And for three days, uh, the sun doesn't move on the on the uh, in the sky. It rises and sets on the same uh, degree. So therefore, it's for three days he's dead. Twenty fifth, he's born again. So now, uh, you know, we can celebrate. He's come back to life, and now he passes over the equator, and he is now springing back to life. And so we call it spring. That's just a one story. But if you understand, the story is based on the life of the sun every 12 months of the year, where it is and what it's doing. And it goes down south and we're freezing to death and, you know, and, and below zero weather here. So <laughs> the sun, as far as we're concerned, is gone. I mean, it may come up and shed a little light up here, but that's about it. It ain't shed nothing else. It's freezing. So to us, the, the sun is gone. It's dead. So don't count on it. It's going to be freezing cold. Well, the majority of plant life goes to sleep or dies or sheds its leaves or whatever. Uh, hibernation happens. A lot of things just slow down, go away for a while during uh, what we call winter, right? So uh, that's it. You know, it all kind of makes sense. Uh, it, it's less life, if you will, yep. be on display. Um, and it's because less of the life-giving energy is being given to that part of the world at that time. So That's exactly right. And that's what I was going to say. So uh, uh, it's, uh, the whole idea is that um, it's, it's light being given to the world. Right. And Jesus is referred to as the, the light of the world. Uh, but what was it that you just mentioned that just sparked another idea? My uh... well, it was about the you know about about trees and animals, uh, you know, going into hibernation, and uh, you know yeah. some some vegetation just simply dies. Nothing really grows in the winter, uh, stuff like that. So you have less life around you to observe at that time as well. So you'd have to think that you know 
it's uh, definitely not the lively part of the year. You know, that's right. When, when people that's talk right. about spring, you know, everything comes back to life. It's yep. not just about the sun coming back around and it getting warmer, but you know, flowers start to bloom and more bugs right. come out and more animals can be seen and, uh, and and so on and so forth. So there is a whole change to it. So at this point, I'm going to take a break and uh, I'll continue to take you guys' questions on Skype or in the chat room as we go further. But uh, what do you think, Jordan? A little break and then we'll continue. Yeah, of course, of course, absolutely. All right, sounds good to me. So Jordan Maxwell is with me, and we are continuing the series on religion. This is part 10, the second hour of the Ocelli Effect, beginning now here on a moon day or a Monday. It is the first day of broadcast for this week and the first day of broadcast for the month of what they call October. Anyhow, you know, and it's funny because Octo seems to indicate eight, but yet it's the tenth month. Anyway, <laughs> there's a there's a lot of stories to be told, but that's not what we're focusing on tonight. Uh, Jordan Maxwell is with me, and we're continuing the series on religion. And uh, part ten, this is, I got to say, uh, it, it's getting more and more interesting now. I uh, ran something by you during the break, which uh, maybe you could just address really quickly. Uh, regarding this idea about the, the solar deity is not as exactly laid out in the scripture up front. It looks like something else is involved in the uh, chronology, if you will, of the story. Um, and they, they point out specifically that, you know, that the Christ figure is not, this is a question, by the way. I'll enter any of your questions that you give me on Skype or, uh, or in the chat room. I will uh, enter them into the conversation. But, uh, you know, we're certainly talking about this stuff. I'll get to the question in just a minute, actually, because I forgot to do something. To remind you, go over to jordanmaxwellshow.com. jordanmaxwellshow.com. Put it all together. Why? Because it's the only website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's. Over there, there is the Research Society button that you can get to. And for a one-time fee, you can... uh, Join and get much deeper into this topic as well as governments and many others by going over to jordanmaxwellshow.com and clicking on the Research Society button. And new feature over there, there are streaming videos which are available. Uh, Again, you can purchase them for a lot less than you would if you were to simply buy a DVD or a Blu-ray or whatever, and you're actually getting them from Jordan Maxwell. Uh, New material is being added to various parts of the website. There are terabytes of material waiting to be added to jordanmaxwellshow.com, some in the Research Society, some other places. Don't know exactly all of what's going on there, but your webmaster is working about as quick as he can, I guess, to try and put this huge library of information that you've gathered. Uh, now, some of the things that are in there, just so you guys know, is not just images and, say, articles written by Jordan, but in some cases he actually refers you to books or gives you uh, some interesting pieces of writing, which uh, I haven't really seen in other places, uh, that are really the things that help to make the points that he's making in his various presentations. It explains it, breaks it down more. And again, if you're a visual learner, uh, a lot of uh, interesting images there to show you a lot of what's being discussed. Again, religion is only one of the small things going on. Not really small at all, but one of the things that appears small considering the large library of work over at jordanmaxwellshow.com and in the research society area again that's the only website that is actually jordan's jordanmaxwellshow.com so anyway the question back to it was uh was more about this idea that according to you know if you read the bible and try and put it together as okay this happened to have occurred during this month of the year uh you'll find that the christ figure was probably born in september not in December, so it looks like the overlay is not exactly right. Uh, but you sort of explained this in the first hour to begin with, and uh, wonder if you wouldn't just address it again really quickly before we move on. Well, yeah, it's interesting. I've got a, I've got an article on that research website uh, on the interesting article. That's another division of my researchers' interesting articles. And this one's talking about the most important day in the Jewish calendar, uh, which was very important, uh, supposedly in the ancient Middle East, uh, was, uh, 9-11. Uh, 
uh, September the uh, uh, 11th. So 9-11 was a very important day uh, f- in relation to uh, Jewish money, Jewish banking, uh, the uh, whole concept of the Jewish uh, economic system of Judaism, the bankers, the Jewish bankers, and there's a very large article, and I think I got that article out of the Jewish Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Judica, and it had like a couple, three paragraphs where it explained that the most important uh, day in the year for the ancient Jews and for Jews today was uh, was 9-11. And that was the time, according to the, the article, that was the time when uh, when all the uh, payments were made to be uh, paid uh, all kinds of of uh, bills came due under the Jewish uh, economic system of banking and that uh, 9/11 was uh, a very important day uh, in the beginning of the fiscal year the beginning of the year financially in in Israel was 9-11. Well, that's interesting. And it says in the article that was, uh, this article I was, I've got on my website, it says that uh, Jesus was most likely born on 9-11, or was it 9, yeah, 9-11, or 9-12, or 9-13, somewhere right around 9-11. And September 11th is when Jesus um, may have been born mm. according to the Jewish, uh, uh, you know, uh, banking uh, symbolism, and so that's very, very in, in, in interesting. And then there's another uh, uh, article that I've got with pictures showing you the article. Uh, it was out of the British Israel World Federation magazine. I used to have the whole set of the. Uh, I, I don't even remember. I think it was called Destiny. Yeah, it was called Destiny Magazine. And they were very large volumes and very large magazines that came out like once a month uh, or once every two months uh, back in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And and it was they were published by an organization, a Masonic organization in England called the British Israel World Federation. And uh, it talks, and there's a a couple, three articles that I photocopied them and put them on my web for you to read them, where it said that Jesus was most likely born on 9-11. And uh, and it's also in the pyramid. Supposedly in the pyramid, uh, the article shows the inside of the pyramid and the uh, mathematic equations uh, you know, in the, the 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 design of the pyramid, and it shows that the messianic uh, kingdom would begin in nine eleven, September eleventh, uh, mm. two thousand something, two thousand or two thousand one. Uh, this is in the old nineteen thirties magazine, Destiny magazine, published by the British Israel. World Federation, which was an ancient Masonic uh, magazine of the British Masons, and it said that uh, that Jesus most likely was was born on 9/11 because of the uh, Jewish banking laws and regulations. So the whole thing begins to be, look very, very interesting, dark stuff. And in relation to 9/11 today, mm-hmm. and uh, and and the, and the implications of Jewish finance and banking in Western civilization in relation to the coming of the Messiah, and also on the back of the dollar bill, the, on the back of the one dollar bill, you will see a pyramid with an all-seeing eye at the top. That all-seeing eye at the top of the pyramid is a Jewish symbol coming directly out of the Old Testament uh, and the New Testament, too. It's a Judeo-Christian symbol for the Messiah. 
And in the Old Testament, it says that the uh, Messiah was uh, a chief cornerstone. Mm. Uh, twice in the Old Testament, it refers to the Messiah, not Jesus, but Messiah. And it says Messiah uh, would be the chief cornerstone. Well, you look up chief cornerstone in the Jewish Encyclopedia, and it says chief cornerstone is a triangle, a small triangle perched on top of a pyramid. Hmm. So a small triangle perched on top of a pyramid is referred to uh, as a chief cornerstone. And so Christians say, well, Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. No, that's not what the Bible says at all. It says Jesus is the chief cornerstone. We'll look that word up, chief cornerstone, in the Bible reference works and dictionaries, and it will show you, especially in the encyclopedias, the chief cornerstone is an eye in a triangle sitting on top of a pyramid. Mm. So, therefore, that pyramid today on the back of the dollar bill is a Jewish symbol for the Messiah. But also in the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as the chief cornerstone the builders rejected. Not cornerstone, chief cornerstone. And again, go to the Jewish, uh, go to the Christian encyclopedias and look up chief cornerstone. It will tell you uh, the, the word that's used for Jesus, the chief cornerstone, is actually a small triangle sitting on top of a large pyramid. Well, two, so, two things enter my mind here, so the, here, here's where I'm going to interject, right? Uh, yeah. First of all, the, the, uh, you know, the, the eye in the, uh, triangle or in the pyramid, depending on, you know, who you talk to, uh, on the back of the, the one dollar bill, I always thought of that as the eye of Horus. Yeah. Um, well, Horus was God's son, the sun god of Egypt. Right. So it was the eye of Horus was, uh, an eye in, in ancient Egypt. And so Horus, when he would, and he was the sun, the sun god was called Horus. Right. And we know that every morning about 5.15, 5.30, Horus would come up and begin to light the world. He was the light of the world, and he was the Egyptian sun god, the sun mm -hmm. deity. And so he would rise every morning. And so today we still use the term Horus rising. Or the horizon. Horizon is Horus rising. Right. And where is horizon? It's on when the sun pops up on the straight line of the earth. We see the sun coming up. We call that the Horus rising or horizon. Right. Now, along so, with that, uh, there was something else you mentioned that sparked uh, an interest in my mind. And, and that is that a lot of people over, over the years, you don't see too many people talking about 9-11 anymore, honestly, yep. uh, Jordan. But when people were still talking about it, chattering about it quite a bit, there were many people that described it as a very ritualistic uh, act oh, yes. that occurred. And I've got to be honest with you, I'm familiar with a lot of rituals. I'm familiar with a lot of rituals uh, uh, from various sets of practices, let's call them. Yep. Um, and, you know, what are your thoughts on the ritualistic aspect of 9-11? I, I think that's exactly what's happening. I think, it, I, I feel that that is a very, a very important point, uh, to look at in relation to your researching 9-11 and what happened in New York and why did it happen in New York? Because New York was the empire state. It's the state of the new empire. 9-11 was a, was a Jewish day for banking, one of the most important days of the year for Jewish banking. And it was in New York, the empire state. Uh, you know, it has to do with the coming of the Messiah, which is on the back of the dollar bill, the triangle, the pyramid. Uh, with the eye, and that's a chief cornerstone, and the, and the and the Jewish encyclopedias will tell you a chief cornerstone is a triangle perched on top of a pyramid. So I think there is something going on here on a very deep level, and you know, and we are so blasé 
and shallow in our thinking that you know something like uh, 9-11 happens and it changed the whole world overnight within hours the whole world of mankind was changed forever but we are so shallow as humans we've been watching bugs bunny and 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 uh, beavers a butthead on television and the ball game so we forget all about the 9-11 now but i don't forget that was a very powerful symbol and there's no doubt in my mind that bloodshed has always been a, a, a an integral part of the value of money i mean i've heard people talking about this who know the subject better than I do but I've, but I've heard uh, experts talking about how the shedding of blood uh, is very important in the in the deciding the value of money it, it, the money's value is based on how much blood is is shed in any, any one country uh, will tell you how uh, important their money is in relation to the value of money worldwide. Depending on what countries are, are shedding more blood than anybody else, their money is far more important. And well, no wonder America is shedding blood everywhere. And so our money is very powerful. Mm. And so there's a whole story there about the connection between the shedding of human blood, human sacrifice, and the value of money. Uh, I could give you some names of the people. Uh, you know, we'll talk about that another time, of some of the people who are talking about that on the web, which are fascinating, brilliant stuff that's being discussed about that subject. So... Uh, but another uh, another one of the metaphors mm -hmm. was um, the fact that Jesus. We're told in the in the in the New Testament that Jesus was arrested, and uh, and and he was arrested and taken to court at night, and it was uh, at night time, and and we're told that uh, in in the reference books of uh, Christianity tells you that. That was really a no-no. You never to do that in the ancient world was to hold night court. You know, we have night courts now, but no, according to the reference works on religion, it said that that was not to be done, uh, to, to hold a court at night. Why? Because it's just not, not the thing to do. Because people couldn't be there in the court. So if you're going to find somebody guilty or put them on trial, do it during the day when people can be there in the broad daylight and you're not hiding anything and everyone's awake and they're there to hear what the what the case is or what the case is made. And so you don't hold a court at night. That's very suspicious. Do it in the daytime when all the adults can be there mm. and everybody can hear it. And so, the, but the story is that no, uh, Jesus was uh, tried at night, and he was found guilty, and sentenced to death, and he was going to die because he was found guilty. Well, what that is actually saying as a metaphor is that the Son, God's Son, the light of the world, the Son, uh, is is the light of the world. Well, here's the point, or here's the metaphor. If somebody who is brilliant, and this is a word we use in relation to somebody being very bright, being very well read, and very highly educated, we say they're very bright. Uh, uh, not, not only that, but some of them are just brilliant. Well, those words, brilliant and, and, and very bright, implies a light. And so these people are really a light to everyone stage they light up the conversation because they're very brilliant and minded and so jesus is the light of the world so he's very brilliant and so but he's being tried at night now the story the metaphor is this you are, are when someone is very bright and they're brilliant and highly educated on a particular subject and they're talking to you, and they're trying to educate you. 
and but you're in the dark. You don't even know what they're talking about. But they're trying to educate you and show you something uh, and enlighten you. Uh, and so what, how does the light come up? Well, it comes up when the sun comes up. And so we call that the dawn, the dawn when the sun comes up. So when someone is brilliant and they're trying to explain something to you and you finally see it, because you've been in the dark, but you finally see what they're talking about, you say, oh, I, it just dawned on me what you're saying. What do you mean it just dawned? on you well i mean now i see what you're saying how do you see well i see with the light and you just shine a light on the subject and now it just dawned on me what the subject is i've always been in the dark and i never understood it mm. but you just shed the light on the subject and now i see it and so what i'm saying is that when someone is brilliant or filled with light and highly enlightened, uh, intelligent, and they're trying to teach you something and explain something to you, but you are in the dark on the subject, then as you're sitting there and listening to this person's talking to you, what are you doing? You're doing in your mind, in your brain, and in your mind, you are hearing this person trying to enlighten you. And so what are you doing? You're uh, obviously, like any other human being, you're trying to decide if this person is as t intelligent as he sounds, and maybe what he's saying is the truth, but then again, he may be just a clever con man, and it may be all a bunch of bull to start with, and a lie, and deception, but then again, it may be true. So what you're doing is you are holding a court, you are judging this person talking mm. in your brain, in your mind. And so you are trying to decide if he's, if he's right or he's wrong, he's guilty, uh, or if he's really bright. But you're doing this, you're holding court. You are just trying to make a decision about this, this person because he's very bright. And so you are holding court in your head. And so this is why the court, the Bible says, Jesus was taken to the temple. Well, that's the side of your head. The lobe on the side of your head is called your temple. Mm. And so when you sit and listening to someone trying to explain to you something, then you are holding court uh, on this person and what they're saying in your temple, in the temple. Now, when you finally decide, no, this guy is just full of bull, uh, it sounded good, it sounded intelligent, but now I, I've decided that he's just lying or he's just a, a con man. Now what you have done is you have put to get to death the sun, the, 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 the light of the world. You put to death the light. Mm -hmm. Where? In your mind. In your brain, you have decided that this brilliance that you've been listening to is a bunch of bull and it has no basis in fact, so therefore you have found it guilty. And where? In your temple, in the temple. And therefore, you are now going to put him to death. And when, where did you put him to death? You put him to death in your mind. And that's why it says Jesus, when he was found guilty, was sentenced to death and Galgatha, look it up in the Bible, it says Jesus died at Galgatha. And Galgatha, even the Bible tells you, Galgatha is called the skull place, or the place of the skull was called Galgatha. Mm. Well, of course, if you're putting to death intellectual enlightenment in your mind or the temple in your head, and you're putting it together, to, and you actually decide he's lying, or it's all a bunch of bull, then you have put him to death where? In your temple. Mm -hmm. And then he died. Where did he die? Where did the light die? It died in your head. And so the God's son, the light of the world, uh, dies uh, at Galgotha. The scripture says in Galgotha, if you look it up, 
it says in the Bible, Golgotha is another name for a place of the skull mm. or the skull place. Yeah, because that's where you put to death the light is in your skull, is in your head. You were listening to right. the light, and then you decided it's a fun, bunch of bull. So now you put it to death in your head. And now God's son, the light of the world, the the brilliance uh, of intellectual and spiritual enlightenment, you just put it to death in the temple of your head. A couple of different Gal-Gatha. people. Yeah. A couple of different people are uh, entering something into the conversation here, just to clarify, I guess. Um and here, here it is, basically in a nutshell. Is it not possible that there were individuals that actually did some of the things that are described or ascribed to the uh, to the figure of Jesus that uh, that might actually have happened? That there might have actually been uh, someone, not necessarily the whole of the story, but maybe it was based on different parts of real stories in some way, along with it being part of the uh, procession of the equinox, which is how they describe it here. Yeah. Um, is, it, uh, is it not possible that this is also what happened? Or is it, uh, well, I've got somebody else that basically says, well, you know, the, the idea that, you know, if, if it is true above, it is true below, and if it's true in, you know, everywhere, this kind of thing. Um, so I guess they're looking for the historical Jesus and... Yeah. Is there, you know, any realistic way that you can draw? I understand. Is there there any realistic possibility that some of this was based on actual things that happened? I say no, period. Ah. Not not at all. That's my viewpoint. And I'm not the world's foremost authority on anything. But I am well aware that the same stories have been told over and over and over again. Uh, in Rome, in an ancient Greek world, in the uh, in the ancient Egyptian world, and the in the Middle East, in the uh, you know what we call the uh, Israel, that ancient place we call today uh, Palestine, we now call it Israel. But Babylon, there was no ancient Greece, Israel. I mean, Babylonian, throughout. Sumerian tales. No, I don't think there was any any person who did anything near what may be mistranslated as a as a metaphor. No, I think the whole thing was a metaphor from day one. Mm. And the church just uh, during the Middle Ages and the early medieval times, during the uh, 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th, ninth century A.D., were putting all of these stories together and, uh, and, and putting them into a story. And so the Bible is called the greatest story ever told. Once you see how, you know, uh, the stories that are told, another classic story, uh, that shows it's a metaphor is that it says that the apostles, some of the apostles, uh, and, and, and a bunch of fishermen, they were all on this little fishing boat. And it says Jesus, uh, was on the fishing boat with them, uh, but it was just a little fishing boat. It's not the Queen Mary or the Titanic. It's just a little fishing boat, right. and there's a few fishermen there, and Jesus was sleeping uh, you know, at night. He he fell asleep, and all the fishermen are out there, and it says, and then a, a storm came up. It called the, the, the Bible says the tempest. A, a terrible, terrible storm came up, and the storm, the Bible says, was so so frightening was that storm, so fierce was that storm, that uh, the Bible says the fishermen uh, started crying out to God and for protection because they knew they were going to die. The storm was so bad, and they're in this little uh, little fishing boat, and this storm was terrible, and they knew they were going to die. They were calling out to God to save them. And then it says somebody got the bright idea to wake up Jesus. Maybe he can help us. So they, they, you know, they, they had to wake him up. Uh, and then he, when he woke up and saw the storm was so bad, uh, it says Jesus told the storm, just quiet down. Slow down and quiet down. 
and it says the Bible says and and, and over a period of time the the uh, the storm started uh, quieting down and quiet and, twi- and quiet until it was finally gone. Well, actually, in point of fact, that's true. Uh, when there's a storm at sea at night. First of all, how would Jesus be sound asleep in a little fishing boat when the fishermen around him were so scared they were going to die? They're calling out to God to protect them because they were going to die. It was so bad, but Jesus, he didn't know none of it. He was sound asleep. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, God, anybody who's in a little fishing boat and there's a terrible hurricane comes up, uh, and you're going to sleep all the way through it, and you didn't know anything happened. They had to wake you up to tell you there's a storm. Uh, it makes no sense until you understand that Jesus is God's Son, the light of the world, and that's what happens. Uh, when a storm is at night, it can be brutal and terrible storms on the ocean. But when the sun comes up, it heats up the atmosphere, and then it begins to dissipate, and the, and the storm begins to dissipate. And finally, after the sun is really coming up, and it begins to warm up the ocean and warm up the waters, uh, the storm dissipates and is gone. Mm. Well, that's a classic example of God's sun telling the ocean to quiet down, and ultimately it, it did. Why? Because it's the sun that affects storms on the ocean, God's Son, the light of the world. So it's a metaphor. There was no man that told the ocean to be quiet. See, I also wonder about the the the, the idea. Well, per, first of all, I mean, I guess one could say Jesus was just a heavy sleeper. But uh, on the other hand, it, it also seems to be something that could be juxtaposed to the Norse gods, uh, and the legends of Norse heroes, as well as some of the far, uh, you know, far Eastern stuff, where you actually have them calling upon storms as weapons. Of course. Um, of course. So the idea that he could just by will, uh, dissipate one of these great catastrophes that could be used as a weapon by an army, by a general who is favored by the gods of thunder and lightning and yes. so on and so forth. Uh, that's an interesting, uh, a way to look at it as an oppositional thing too, isn't it? Yes. But again, that would be some kind of a metaphor. Oh yeah. I, I real, I realize it's a metaphor. I'm not saying that a man does this, but the yeah. idea that you can ascribe it to a man though, and tell yeah. it as this story is interesting because, you know, again, this is usually, <clears throat> to my mind anyway, the ancient world trying to explain some of the things they see around it, right? Yeah. Why would something come through and destroy our village? Why would something come through and do this? Well, it no, must be that we angered the person who controls this thing. Yeah, and right. that would be, you know, the god of this, that, mm-hmm. or the other, or the deity of the village, or the deity of the swamp. I mean, you had deities for everything in the ancient world, you know. No doubt about it. So yes, Absolutely. So the idea here, I, I think, is interesting in that, uh, metaphorically, you could say it's in opposition to some of those previous uh, 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 bits of of, uh, uh, of religious faith from other other places, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, well, we know Jehovah was a storm god based on on the uh, on the storm god in the Middle East, uh, Yahweh and Yahweh and Jehovah was the god of the storm, and he would throw his lightning down to the earth. And when the uh, and it says that the Hebrews when they were at the mountain with Moses, and Moses was going up into the mountain to talk with God, it said that uh, there were lightning and thundering. And the scripture says that the thunder was the voice of God. Mm. God was talking to his people and talking and frightening his people because uh, his voice was a thunder. And he was throwing lightning rods and he was throwing lightning uh, all around to frighten the people. Well, that's uh, uh, that's what a volcano does. It's lightning and thunder. And the scripture says in 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 in, uh, in the book of Job thirty eight I think it is uh, that uh, you know God thunders uh, you know wonderfully with his voice and frightens the world and that uh, he throws down 
uh, his his weapons of lightning to frighten the people. Well, we're talking about a lightning and thunder. And so, you know, we now see that the old Jewish God, one of the old Jewish gods was the God of thunder and lightning, or Zeus, because Zeus was the God of thunder and lightning. <clears throat> and Zeus was, uh, you know, in, in, in Latin, Zeus becomes uh, Deus, D-E-U-S. Instead of Zeus, is D-E-U-S, a Deus. And Deus is, if you look at the encyclopedia, will tell you that Deus is actually the god Zeus. Mm. And and, uh, and Zeus spelled backwards is, uh, uh, what was it I said before, the... Um, Oh, uh, Suez, the the the, uh, the Gulf of Suez and the Suez mm-hmm. Canal. Well, Suez is merely Zeus spelled backwards. So I'm just saying that all of these stories in the New Testament and in the Old Testament are based on older, uh, far more older, uh, and they are much and they are very obviously, uh, you know, symbolic stories. When God's Son wakes up. <laughs> during a storm that was scaring the hell out of everybody on the boat. And it was not the Queen Mary, so it wasn't secure, and everybody knew they were going to die. It was so bad, except Jesus. He didn't know nothing. He was sound asleep and didn't hear it. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, obviously, it's a symbolic story, because Jesus is God's son. Well, the sun comes up, and the, and the, and the oceans and the storms on the oceans will quiet down. Mm. So you know, uh, there's there's about thirty more stories like that uh, in the Bible talking about Jesus that make sense if you see Jesus as a symbolic representation of the sun, mm. the S U N, the light of the world. So see, it's interesting a- to note though that also when when you take a look at Zeus as a figure, uh, which you know he, he existed with more than one name. Uh, you know, depending on which set of, uh, the pantheon you're looking at, because, yeah. you know, he had a, he had a different name to, uh, the Greeks than he did to the Romans and so on. But, uh, there are some people that postulate that, uh, he was based on a king at one point who, uh, seemed to be extremely powerful and, you know, it, it wasn't uncommon in the ancient world to sort of have uh, legendary stories about powerful people travel around a bit. And uh, some people say that, you know, that that is a whole cloth creation from legend, right? Well, yeah, and, and, and I, I think there's something to that, yeah, because when you begin to look at uh, the legends coming out of the ancient world, there are bits and pieces that keep popping up that are telling you the same story in the New Testament about Jesus. So I'm sure that there's the, whoever was putting this story together called the Bible the greatest story ever told. I'm sure that they were well aware of all of the stories. Mm. And they were putting the, the this whole story together so that it all, uh, you know, seemed to make sense. Uh, but if you stop and think about it, when was a man born of a virgin? Never has been, and not now, and never will be. Mm. And and uh, and it says that Jesus was the son of a carpenter. That's another thing that's interesting. Jesus, we were told, was the son of a carpenter. Well, actually. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but in the Encyclopedia Judica and the Christ and the uh, and the Catholic Encyclopedia also, uh, there's quite a few different encyclopedias uh, on biblical reference works that talk about a carpenter and the word uh, in in the uh, in the, uh, the the Latin and in the Greek language and the Aramaic. The word uh, that is translated carpenter is actually an Aramaic word for a bricklayer, mm. one who works with bricks. Well, a bricklayer will refer to as a mason. And so, therefore, Jesus was a bricklayer, not a carpenter. And so it's been mistranslated by the church purposely 
uh, to be a carpenter. No, it's not carpenter. The word in Arabic was a bricklayer. And so one who builds walls with bricks, and what, what do we call them? We call them masons, brick masons. And so the scripture now is saying, uh, you know, Jesus was a mason. It was a Masonic story. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we could go on all night talking about all the, 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 the terms and the words and the etymology of not only the words, but the ideas that have, uh, have piled up into the Old and New Testament that shows it was just copied from earlier manuscripts and just copied especially the story of Jesus is nothing more than the story of the war between the sun and the prince of darkness and the prince of darkness as I said was called Set in Egypt so it did get dark at sunset and so um, yeah. light if you wanted to personify the, the, the light if you want to make light into an actual uh, person uh, for for a story. If you're writing a story about the war with light and darkness, if you want to make light into a actual person in your story, <clears throat> light in the Latin was Lucius, mm-hmm. which means light. Now, if you want to make Lucius into an actual uh, into an actual man or or, or person. Uh, in your story that you're going to make a movie out of and you're going to make the story about the war between light and darkness. And so there are going to be two actors. One actor is going to be the evil prince of darkness, the, the devil, and one's going to be the, the, the principle of light in the world. Well, light in Latin is Lucius. So if you were going to personify light into a man, uh, the, the word would then be Luke. And so Luke is a, is a word for light, hmm. just like the temple of Lux. Luke, Lux, Lux and Luke is light, temple of light. So, and we say that the, the, you know, the part of the story of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the sun god of Egypt was that in the morning, he came up in the morning, his, his, his title was Horus, <clears throat> and he was rising. As where did he rise? He rose on the Horus rising, or the horizon. Mm-hmm. And so he walked across the steppe, according to the Egyptian religion. Uh, God's son, the light of the world, walked across the, uh, the sky in 12 steps. So when he came up in the morning, the first time he picked up over the, uh, the horizon, uh, and, and shortly after that, he now moves up a little bit higher, so he's now Horus of the second step. And then later on, he becomes Horus of the third step, and then of the fourth step. And when he reaches the sixth step, or the fifth one, the fifth or sixth, he becomes known as Horus, the Most High God. Why? Because it don't get any higher than 12 noon. Mm. We call it 12 noon, or high noon. Why? Because the sun does not get any higher than noon. So, therefore, the sun, if it was a person representing the sun, uh, his name would be, uh, you know, Horus, Risen. Uh, and so he walked across the sky. The, uh, the, the Egyptians said the sun walks across the sky in 12 steps. So it's a 12-step program. Well, that's what happens to you. You go to school in the first grade, and it's a 12-step program. You end up in the 12th grade. Right. And so, therefore, if you're walking across the sky, you become known as Luke Skywalker. And you're doing battle with the Darth Vader. This is what the, the Star Wars was all about. The war in the stars. The Star Wars. Right. Luke Lucius Light walking across the sky was Luke Skywalker. And he's ultimately going to do meet up and do battle with the Prince of Darkness. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's even in movies. They're, they're playing with us again and again 
with movies and metaphors and symbolic stuff. Right. Last last yeah. bit of, that I want to interject from uh, from some of the feedback we're getting live is this uh, what you're talking about right now, which you were just talking about regarding the uh, the way the sun travels and the twelve steps. Uh, does this not also serve as a metaphor for the ages? Because we go through each age astronomically, and there are twelve of them. Well, that's true. There, uh, you, you, you can add that in, and it does have some validity because, yeah, there are twelve ages. Why? Because there are twelve signs of the zodiac. And if the twelve signs of the zodiac uh, represents the twelve months of the year, and and each month has one twelfth of the light that the master is giving it. You know, the master is the sun. And so the sun is shedding his light each month. Uh, and so each month is a different sign of the zodiac. So therefore the sun has 12 helpers or 12 followers that follow the sun. And so you know, even the Beatles have got songs called follow, you know, the following the sun. Uh, and so, yeah, the 12 helpers and the 12 signs of the Zodiac or the 12 ages of the Zodiac. Yeah, once you begin looking at this from a metaphysical, spiritual point of view as a metaphor, then all kinds of interesting ideas can pop up now uh, that might make a little sense each time. You know, there may be something to it. So, but my point being is that the entire story is a metaphysical, symbolic metaphor telling us about the life of mankind. You come into this world, you're born, you're on the horizon, rising, you're on the horizon, and then you, uh, you know, walk across the sky in 12 steps. <clears throat> it's a 12 step program for alcoholics, a 12 step program for kids in school. And the 12 step is Luke Skywalker walking across the sky in 12 steps. Uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's all very, very interesting and all very obvious to me because I've been looking at it for so long. Uh, and there's so many more, uh, you know, stories we could talk, talk about. In right. relation to Jesus in the New Testament, but we don't have time. No, we don't. We're almost out of time, and I'm going to uh, enter one small question here, and that's the end of it for tonight as far as the questions go. But I do appreciate you guys for writing in and obviously for listening. Um, so here's the thing. This person asks that uh, there is a legend behind why Friday the 13th, and in fact the number 13, is uh, such a scary thing for a lot of people, creates uh I, I can't even understand this word they're using here, but something like d not good feelings, I'm guessing, is uh, what they mean. And uh, <clears throat> they're wondering if it is because it goes beyond the number 12, that since 13 is one step past what is natural, is this why people were probably scared of it long before the Knights Templar were slaughtered? This yeah, well, yes, asked. yes, and, and it's true. There is something to that because... Jesus was referred to as the master. He is the master teacher, but he had 12 followers. And so, and so the 12 followers helped spread God's son's light, the light of intellectual, spiritual wisdom and understanding. Uh, you know, each one of the month had, had one twelfth of God's son's light. And so the 12 signs of the zodiac uh, with the master is the sun. That's why that famous painting of Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper. Right. The Last Supper was uh, was twelve apostles, and the first one to Jesus' right in the picture is a woman. Why? Because there was a woman apostle, and and why? Because the one of the constellations of the zodiac is Virgo, right. the Virgin. And so, uh, yeah, so the, the 12 apostles are the 12 followers of Jesus with their master making 13. And yeah, so the, the, there's been a, a lot of important stuff around 13 and 12 in the ancient world you know, before Christianity. Right. 
Oh no, but that that was I think that was the point they were trying to make is that there was a reason for this long before that yeah. legend because uh-huh. that, that's what everybody points to is uh you know this was the day that the Knights Templar were uh you know all arrested yep. and uh, put all to death arrested. and all that. Mm-hmm. But uh but there's actually stuff that goes previous to that story which makes me question to quite honestly the the history of the Knights Templar. Um Sounds almost like an ancient story being retold, <laughs> right? That's right. Uh, you know, and, and again, we, we, we see, you know, it, it's, it's much like, uh, it's much like Mark Twain said, you know, uh, uh, history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme sometimes. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and that's what I keep seeing. But anyway, we're done with this particular episode before we're out of here. Uh, again, I want to remind people that if you go to Jordan Maxwell's show, dot com that's jordan maxwell show dot com that is the only website that is actually jordan maxwell's uh now when you go there there is the research society which there is a button for uh i urge you to join it and to learn uh because you go in way deeper than we are able to even cover in this series on this subject but there's a lot more in there uh government uh you know money um, the various, various things throughout the world are actually discussed on there. There's a lot of sections. Only one of them is on religion, and there are terabytes of information waiting to be added to it. There's uh, constantly be- stuff being added to it. In fact, recently, there is a section now where you can get video on demand, um, which will cost you less than if you were to, say, go ahead and buy a DVD or a Blu-ray of uh, some of Jordan's work or something like that. For a couple of bucks, you can just get it directly from Jordan's website. And again, straight from the source. So, jordanmaxwellshow.com is the website. I urge you to go to it. Check it out. And hey, you know what? While you're there, Jordan would always be uh, appreciative of an email. Uh, comment to him about this show, what you liked, what you Absolutely. didn't like. Absolutely. Uh, right. You know, hey, look, I appreciated that you guys did this, or God, you guys are stupid, or whatever it is, anything actually, go ahead uh, yep. and, and send it along, and I'm sure Jordan will be happy to read it. You can also make a donation over there. There's a donate button, um, and Jordan at uh, at all times is appreciative of that because, much like me, he sort of survives off of what it is that uh, that people are willing to give. So just so you know that. <laughs> There it That's is. Precisely um, right. I live on. Uh, I, I live my life, uh, uh, you know, on donations because I spent my whole life doing what I do, and that is all day and all night long reading and studying and cross referencing and taking notes so that I can now talk and be a teacher to teach people why because they don't have time to spend their whole life in a library reading the ancient world. Well, I did. Mm-hmm. I I purposely uh, you know rent my life uh, by by not you know, seeking money and seeking positions and and having a job. I just sat in libraries continually and took notes and cross reference and photocopied and been and I was doing all of that before the computer before the advent of computers. So I did it the hard way. Right. And so that's why today I don't have anything because I spent all my life pursuing knowledge only to find out that when you get to be 80 years old, you don't have anything, zero. Now you have to depend on people who care about what you've done and want to help you and keep you alive for, for a little bit longer. So that's why I've asked for donations. And uh, and and also, like you said, I have two brand new uh, videos that are being streamed. You can you know, download them and stream them and watch them immediately. So again, thank you for being on your show. And I guess we'll talk again next week and we'll do it again. It looks like we're going to have to do part 11 next week. Now, I'm just keeping track of these numerically, but I have no idea how many parts this series will be. Uh, we are just going to continue on until Jordan feels as though he's finished. It's that yep. simple. So, <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm uh, pretty close to finish. I'm 78 years old. Well, listen, so, I, I didn't mean finish that way. No, uh, I know. I was teasing you. You know, know, but, uh, but look, I, I, I appreciate you taking the time to do this, certainly. And, and, and again, guys, Jordan Maxwell Show. 
dot com is his website. Uh, there will definitely be a link to it in the notes for this show on the podcast if you're catching it later. But um, there it is. I, I, I think uh, I think we've covered this quite well. And uh, gee, the eleventh show that might have to be a little bit more special. I, I don't know. I, I I'm I'm just waiting to see what it is you develop because <laughs> um, we we will. You know, you're, you're, you're the guide here. You have taught a lot of people, including myself, uh, to look at things and to re-examine things that, uh, we might have taken for granted much earlier on. But you see, that is the trouble. Um, we are given to take certain things for their alleged face value, right? Yeah. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it's not always the true value, if you will of what mm-hmm. it is and it's not always the truth of it some things are much greater than they appear and some things are much less complex than they appear some things are just well not much to them other than a story but when we're talking about religion there's a lot to it because it has driven the activities of people it has driven the realities of individuals across the planet entire countries wars uh, you know, entire populations have been wiped out or even planted in certain places based on it. So it is one of those things that is always worthy of examination, Jordan. And I want to thank you for doing this with us again. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you for allowing me. We'll talk another time. 